So this is the seventh Sunday of Easter, which literally means that it's the in-between time, right? As I just told the kids, Ascension Day was May 25th. So this past Thursday is the day that we should have celebrated the Ascension of Jesus, right? And the, the reading that we have from Acts talks about how the disciples are all there and Jesus is taken up into heaven and the angels come and ask them, what are y'all looking at? Yeah. Why are you looking up? How many of you have ever seen anything that you couldn't explain? And what did you do? You stared at it, right? I mean, come on. What did the angels expect the disciples to be doing? Jesus just was lifted up off the ground and taken up into heaven. I'd be staring up at him too, right? I mean, that's what you expect. But why did the angels come and say, what are you doing? What are we supposed to be doing? We'll get back to that in just a minute. Jesus this week prays for whom? Chapter 17 of the Gospel of John is the, what is known as Jesus' high priestly prayer. Right? The Gospel of John is not like the other three Gospels. The Gospel of John is very much centered on who Christ is and what Christ has come to do. And it's not about, his, about the story of His birth or the story of the things that he, he, he interacted with the people, but it's about Him doing signs to show that He is the Messiah. It's about him doing signs showing of, of who's God, who God is and what Jesus came to do. It's about Jesus doing things so that other people can come to know who God is. And here in the 17th chapter of the Gospel of John, we just got through with Jesus teaching the disciples. And Jesus goes off and prays. And it's actually in three sections. Verses 1 through 6, Jesus prays for himself. Right? Did you all follow that when I read it? I tried to read it really slow because it's really confusing. Right? Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son so the Son may glorify you since you have given Him authority over all people to give eternal life to whom you have given Him. And this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom is sent. I glorified you on earth by finishing the work that you gave me to do. So now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had in your presence before the world existed. I have made known your name to those whom you gave me from the world. Right there, he switched, right? So it's verses 1 through 5, he prays for himself. Verse 6, he prays for... Who does he pray for? I just said it. Not the people of the world. The disciples? But who are the disciples? Right? Because it actually says down here, he says... In verse 9, I am asking on their behalf. I am not asking on behalf of the world. He hadn't got to the world yet. That's verses um, um, later on. I forget exactly where it splits again. But at, towards the end of the chapter, of chapter 17, Jesus actually prays for those who will come to know through the words of those whom you've given me. Right? So he doesn't pray for the whole world, but he prays for the disciples. Or he prays for those whom God has given to Jesus out of the world. And who is that? Okay, I heard, I heard believers and I heard something else. The Israelites. Ooh. I like that. I have to expand on that a little bit more. That's a sermon for another time. The Israelites, right? The, is, the Jews are actually God's chosen people in the Old Testament. God said, you are my people and I will be your God and you will be my people. Right? And none of that ever changed regardless of what happened in the New Testament. The Israelites are still God's chosen people. And technically they are the people that would have been given to Jesus. But they didn't really follow through. Some of them. But again, that's a, that's a sermon for another time. But he gave people to Jesus. And some would say that's the disciples, which are the twelve. Right? Twelve. Notice I said twelve and not eleven. I said twelve. Because Judas is included in that. Or is that all the believers? 
Because there's still people out there that don't believe, right? So Jesus could be praying for those who are going to come to believe because of what you do. What you say to somebody of how you live your life so that they see you and they see Jesus living through you. Right? Someone could come to believe in Jesus Christ as the Savior of all the world because of something you do. You ever thought about that? There's a saying out there that says the only Bible someone ever read may be you. Jesus, the night before he was put on trial, beaten nearly to death, and then hung on a cross, prayed for you. And he asked God that we would be glorified through him, and that we would know what eternal life is, and that we would have the glory that God gave to Jesus in order that we can give it to others. I think this is the quietest y'all have ever been. Is this just scary? Right? Think about it for a moment. Jesus is praying. And how many of us tell people we're going to pray for them and they never hear those prayers? Right? But... We assume that people are actually praying for us when they say they're going to pray for us. We don't get to hear those prayers. But here you get to eavesdrop on your Savior praying for you. And this is scary stuff. And why is it scary? Because it's Jesus asking for us to be one with God and Jesus just as Jesus is one with God. And it's much more scarier than Jesus telling us, I want you to go to St. John's homeless shelter and feed a hundred people because that's easy, right? Okay. It may not actually be easy to go to St. John's homeless shelter for some people and to feed homeless people, but it's easy because I can say I fed a hundred people. I'll count them as they come through the line, right? I've done my duty. I did what Jesus told me to do. But here Jesus is saying, I want all of these people that you've given me, all of the believers in the world to be one with me and to be one with you. And I want them to have what you've given me. I want them to have the glory that you've given to me so that they can turn around and give that to other people. So that other people will come to know who you are through them. And I get it. That's scary. Just about as scary as it is for me to stand up here every Sunday morning before you guys. I might look like I'm all calm and collected, but this is one of the most nerve-wracking things I ever do. Right? And the day that it isn't is the day that I'll stop. Because Jesus has called each and every one of us. Jesus has named each and every one of us. To be his disciple, to be his hands and feet, to go out into the world, to share the love and the glory that he's given to all of us. Right. And glory is important here in this day and age because glory is about what they live for. It's an honor and shame society. And if you don't have honor and you don't have glory, then you're nothing. And the glory that Jesus wants to give you. The glory that Jesus is giving you because God has given it to him is not just some random glory out there because you did something good. It's God's glory. It's God's honor. Something to be handled very gently and safely. But something also to not hold on too tightly, but to give to others. Because that's what Jesus has called us to do. When the angels came to the disciples on the mountain and they're staring up, probably with their jaws hanging wide open, going, what in the world is going on? He died. He was alive with us. He did some stuff with us. And now all of a sudden he's going up into heaven. And the angels come and they say, what are you doing? Did you not get the three years and the 40 days? You're supposed to go out into the world and tell everybody about this, right? He said that you will be my witnesses. Jesus said to the disciples before he ascended, you will be my witnesses to where? Look in your bulletin. Where? Jerusalem. Judea. 
Samaria, and all of the world, right? These are concentric circles. Jerusalem. And then a little bit further, Judea. And a little bit further is Samaria. And then all of the world, right? It's like you throw a rock into the water and what does it do? It ripples out. We can't just stay where we are. We need to go and share everything that God has given us with everyone around us so that we can give them the glory that God has given to us and that we may know eternal life. How many of you are waiting on eternal life? You're supposed to raise your hands. <laughs> How many of you expect eternal life? It's okay if you question it. Martin Luther questioned it on his deathbed, whether or not, right? The man who told us that we're saved by grace, not by works, right? We're saved by grace through faith, not by the works that we've done so that no one can boast. But Martin Luther on his deathbed worried that he had done enough. To get to be with God. It's okay if we worry about that. But we all expect someday to be with God, right? And Jesus here tells us in, in John chapter 17 what eternal life is, right? If I said, what's John 3.16? Right, okay. What's... No, that was good. I actually heard it. You know, that was much better than Psalm 23 when we tried that a few weeks ago. So now what is without looking at your bulletins? What is John 17, 3? No, 17, 3. What is John 17, 3? Without looking at your bulletins because it's in your bulletins. This is the most this is an, as an important verse as John 3, 16 and 3, 17. 3, 17 is important, right? For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world might be saved through Him. Right? But what is John chapter 17, verse 3? It's a verse you all need to memorize. I'm going to ask you next week. John 17, 3 says, And this is eternal life, that they may know God and know that Jesus Christ is His Son that whom He sent. It's a little bit out of order on the second part there. But that's the general case of what John 17, 3 is. This is eternal life. That you know God and you know that He sent His only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world. This is eternal life. That you know God. How many of you know God? Know here is a is an intimate kind of knowing. It's kind of like when you break your arm, you know what pain is, right? You don't have to read a book about what happens in your life and this is what you're going to feel, right? When you feel pain, you know what pain is. Whether it's a physical pain or an emotional pain, you know it. And that's what knowing is in the Bible. And that's eternal life, that you know God, that you have a relationship with God. Eternal life is not something that we're waiting for. It's something that we're living in right now because Jesus Christ came, completed his work and showed us how to live and gave us the love and the glory of God so that we in turn could go out into the world and share that with everyone. If you haven't noticed or haven't seen them in a while, the signs when you go out the doors today over either door that go outside, look up and read the sign. Look up and read the sign as you go out. Because that's what we're all called to do. And that's what we're all called to be. To go into the world and to give what He's given us. Because it's going to be refilled. Because that's what Jesus Christ has called each and every one of us to do. To not stand on a hill and gawk, but to go into the world and share his love. And he's going to be there to help you. So go, remembering that he prayed for you and that he's always going to be with you. And share what he's given you with everyone who you see.